We must now move on to um, questions to the Minister for Infrastructure. Question 3 and question 9 have been withdrawn. I call Alex Easton. Uh, question 1, Madam Deputy Principal Speaker. <clears throat> We are reliant on our airports and seaports to access key markets and destinations, whether that's for pleasure, business, education, or simply to visit family and friends. The connections to our airports and ports will be increasingly important in creating the conditions for prosperity and key to our ability to compete in a global skills-based and innovative economy, not simply for markets, but also for investment and talent. The city airport has an important role to play in providing this access and already has a significant market share of short-haul domestic services aided by its accessibility to the city centre. In relation to improving the rail link to the airport, there are currently no plans to provide a new rail halt at the George Best Belfast City Airport. My immediate railway priorities must be to maintain and improve passenger capacity and remove bottlenecks on the existing rail network. However, this does not preclude new halts where passenger demand justifies it and additional finance is obtainable. I have started preparations for the development of a new Belfast Metropolitan Transport Plan. The plan will provide an opportunity to consider the roles that private cars, trains, buses and taxis can all play in connecting the Belfast City Airport. However, linking the airport more directly by rail may not indeed necessarily be the best way to serve this important gateway in the shorter term particularly as it is currently served by a very frequent, recently upgraded bus service to and from the city centre. Alex Easton for a supplementary. Could I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Would the Minister agree with me that the best way to attract foreign investment is to have the best transport uh, infrastructure in place? And would not a train halt outside the George Best City Airport help to do that and increase passenger numbers? <sighs> It doesn't necessarily follow uh, that you, if you have a train halt, you will necessarily uh, be providing a better service uh, for business and investment. There is a very successful bus service that runs. Uh, many investors who come in and out of the city airport, indeed I have used it myself before, um, use this uh, service. Uh, it is very reliable and, as I say, it is a very welcome service for those people who want to invest in the city and the region. I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, uh, Deputy Principal Speaker. I uh, just want to ask the Minister if, uh, if there's currently a bus shuttle service from Sydenham Halt to the airport, and if not, would he give consideration to introducing, uh, as a short-term interim measure, uh, a shuttle bus service? Uh, I thank the member. As I understand it, the airport, the airport does provide an on-demand shuttle bus service between the airport terminal and the railway halt at Sydenham. I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister, in his response to Mr Easton, outlined some of the immediate priorities for the Department for Infrastructure. Can the Minister assure the House that one of those immediate priorities will be the delivery of the Belfast Transport Hub over the course of the next five years? Minister. I thank the member for his question. Indeed, uh, certainly the Belfast Hub is a flagship project for the Executive. Um, I look forward to working with Belfast City Council colleagues and delivering what I think would be a transformative project, not just for the City of Belfast, but entirely the North. Uh, it is key to developing our public transport network, uh, and I very much look forward to doing all I can uh, in the years ahead. Uh, there is no doubt that Brexit and the EU referendum result is a huge challenge. Um, the Belfast Transport Hub is one particular project that likely would have benefited, maybe up to 40 per cent funding. Um, this is money that will now have to be found elsewhere. So this is a challenge that I am up for, for, for meeting, um, because as I say, as I have outlined previously to the member, it, I think this project does have a transformative effect. Iram Sir, Ian Milne. I call Ian Milne. Uh, what is the current uh, position within uh, the Department's transport plans? Uh, well, as stated to the, to the member previously, I'm commencing work to refresh the full suite of my department's transport plans. Work will begin in the very new, near future on the Regional Strategic Transport Network Transport Plan. This will be followed by a series of local transport plans, including the Belfast Metropolitan Transport Plan, which I alluded to earlier. These plans will be developed to coordinate with the delivery of the local development plans. Local transport plans will be developed in my department, but will be done so working in close with council officials. I call Kelly Armstrong. 
Principal Deputy Speaker, um, can I just go back to the issue about um, the airport and to ask the Minister what discussions have been had with TransLink and the airport about proving, improving access, particularly for early flights, to enable interconnectivity for those business travellers? I thank the member for a question. It's probably better directed at TransLink uh, to talk to them about what discussions they have had with the city airport. Um, but as I say, so perhaps point the, the member in that direction. Aram Sir Framakan, I call Fram. I am fully committed to the delivery of the Belfast Rapid Transit, including not only the current phase which connects East Belfast, West Belfast and the Titanic Quarter via the city centre, but also future extensions to the north and the south of the city. I regard the Belfast Rapid Transit as a transformational public transport project for the city. It represents an exciting opportunity for Belfast going forward and it is a major commitment for my department in support of an executive flagship project. The implementation of the Belfast Rapid Transit is progressing well. To date, my department has completed the new Dundonald Park and Ride facility and sections of the routes in the Falls Road and Upper Newton Ards Road, including the introduction of new peak hour bus lanes. The new peak hour bus lanes support a more reliable and attractive bus service for passengers using these busy arterial routes. Since the introduction of the new peak hour bus lanes, there have been substantial increases in passenger numbers and improvements to journey times. The detailed specification for the BRT vehicles has been finalised. This process included engagement with the disability and elderly sectors through the Inclusive Mobility and Transport Advisory Committee. The diesel-electric hybrid BRT vehicles will provide a high-quality, accessible environment for passengers in terms of comfort, space, security and onboard information. I am pleased to say that the BRT system remains within budget and on target to become operational in September 2018. for supplementary. I know the Minister has already touched on the question about the transit vehicles, but could he elaborate on when the vehicles would be ready? There seemed to be some delay in the process. The contract was awarded in November 2015. Since then, my department has finalised the detailed specification for the vehicles in conjunction with TransLink and the manufacturers Van Hool. This process included engagement with the disability and elderly sectors uh, through IMTAC in relation to accessibility. The BRT vehicles will be 18 metre diesel electric hybrid articulated buses with a capacity of around 100 people. They will provide a high quality accessible environment for passengers in terms of comfort, space, security and onboard on information. The first Belfast Rapid Transit vehicle is currently being assembled by Van Hool. Once this vehicle has been completed, it will be subject to extensive road testing before being delivered to Belfast in 2017. Subsequent vehicles will be delivered prior to the system going live in September 2018. I call Jenny Palmer. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, and I thank the Minister for his update on the uh, rapid transit system. Given that Belfast was found to be the United Kingdom's third most congested city yesterday, is the Minister content that enough is being done to address this problem, in particular the York Street interchange, which would be transformative to dealing with congestion? Well, congestion is very much uh, an issue that faces um, not just you know, our own city here in Belfast, but you know, it's the same for Derry, it'll be the same for Dublin. Uh, I was recently in China. It's the same on a very much different scale in places like Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, but something as a BRT is designed uh, to have a, a transformative effect, I, I think that it will. I, I, I am bringing forward uh, bicycle strategies in the next number of months also. I think active transport uh, and greenways. We see the success of the Cumber Greenway, of the Conswater Greenway. These are hugely transformative active travel and public transport projects that given time and I think a public appetite which is there certainly I believe will, will have a very transformative impact. The York Street interchange of course as well you can see the strategic importance for a project such as that but as I've outlined to the members across the way with the Belfast hub Brexit and the implications of funding for a project such as York Street interchange uh, creates a substantial hurdle that now has to be met. I call William Humphreys. 
I yeah, thank the Minister for his answers so far. I, I welcome the Minister's reassurance to this House around the Belfast Transportation Hub. That is a welcome commitment. Can I also welcome the investment that there has been to date in the Belfast Rapid Transit system and that I welcome the fact that work has started. But the Minister will be aware has the member that, a question? That, that, that the work is actually in relation to East and West Belfast. Has Can the I ask the Minister for a time scale as to when it might be extended to North and South Belfast? Well, and I thank the member for his comments at the outset. Um, the member will be aware of the timescales involved for this particular phase. Um, you know, I, I would assume that similar timescales will be involved when we extend this out to north and the south. Um, I think there's a level of excitement around this particular phase uh, that will only be matched with the north-south route. Um, it's, a, it's a route I travel often, and certainly uh, I, I don't think it, it takes experts in this field to realise that this again will be a transformative route between the north of our city, right through the city centre, and to the south, uh, and out to an area such as the is carried off. Uh, I think it would be much uh, welcomed, uh, something I hope to progress certainly at some point in this mandate. I call Paula Bradshaw. Um, I think the Minister has just answered my question. Thank you. Uh, question number four. I call uh, Jim Allister. Report. A wide range of memorials to deceased persons have been placed over many years on or close to property owned or controlled by my department. Most of these relate to fat fatal incidents occurring on or near roads, while a small number of these incidents are directly related to the conflict here in the north over the last 40 years or so. Most, however, are not. These memorials comprise many different formats, from permanent structures to temporary floral tributes to the so-called ghost bikes. Given the transient nature of many of these, it is not possible to state with any certainty how many there are across the whole of the North. My department does not endorse any of these, but the long-standing practice has been to not remove any such memorials unless road safety is directly compromised. Any memorials on the property of my department's arm's-length bodies are matters for the boards of those organisations. Jim Allister for a supplementary question. So it's official policy of this executive and department to do nothing about terrorist memorials on public property. Can I ask the Minister, is that a complacency born of empathy with the glorification of terrorism which these distasteful memorials represent? Well, the member will be well aware that there are memorials to UDR, British Army, for the minister must be heard. Can the, the member, the member will be aware from speaking from of a sedentary a position? of memorials right across the political spectrum from the British Army, UDR, police, um, different groups right across society. As I've outlined, there are also memorials to those who have been deceased uh, at roadsides. Uh, the, the department's toleration policy was developed as a result of the organisation's experience in, in dealing with illegal roadside memorials and the desire to avoid exacerbating the problem or putting the safety of staff or contractors at risk. Examples of our toleration in similar exercise include issues such as flag flying on streetlights or cafes and bars placing tables and chairs on public footpaths <coughs> or space permits. I call Trevor Clark. I call Trevor Clark. I feel I don't really want to thank the Minister for his answer, but can I ask the Minister can he differentiate the difference then between terrorists and actually forces who were murdered by terrorists and the difference between those uh, monuments? Minister. <laughs> I don't think the question has any relevance uh, whatsoever to my responsibility uh, as Minister for the Department of Infrastructure, but, but as I've outlined already, there are a plethora of memorials on roadsides from floral tributes uh, to all different types of, you know, we mentioned the ghost pikes, those who have unfortunately been killed as, as a result uh, of an RTA. Uh, so it's, it's not my responsibility to get into that. I call Chris Little. Question number five. I will shortly be holding a public consultation on my draft Belfast Bicycle Network Plan, the first of a series of plans to help bring coherent continuous and comfortable bicycle infrastructure within the reach of most people within our towns and cities. This is part of the vision and the bicycle strategy to give people the freedom and confidence to travel by bicycle for everyday journeys and to significantly increase the number of shorter journeys that we make by bicycle. One of the three pillars of the bicycle strategy is to build a comprehensive network for the bicycle. The Belfast Bicycle Network Plan will provide a framework for the development of safe, attractive cycling provision throughout Belfast over the next 10 years. It will do this by bringing good quality cycle routes within 400 metres of around two-thirds of Belfast City Council residents. 
The member will be aware of a number of cycle schemes that are currently being built within the city centre as flagship schemes to demonstrate the kind of cycling infrastructure that will be delivered, and I am keen to deliver more of these segregated cycle routes in the future. The network plan approach will contribute to several outcomes of the draft programme for government, such as connecting people and opportunities through our infrastructure and supporting and encouraging long, healthy, active lives. Chris Little for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for uh, his uh, answer and uh, I welcome uh, his support and his uh, shared belief in the social, health, economic and benefits of cycling to our community. 70% uh, of MLAs returned to the Assembly supported the election cycle campaign, uh, one, one of which aims was to have a budget for at least £10 per head of population for cycling infrastructure. Can I ask the Minister uh, if he is going to be able to increase the spend per head from last year, which was only £1.30, to that target of £10 per head? I thank the member for uh, raising this issue. I think I was one of those MLAs that also uh, signed up to, to the various pledges. Um, this is something I think we need to see an increased spend and an increased budget when we look at active travel and our cycling infrastructure. Uh, I think it's a generational project. You know, my Greenway strategy will be generational. I've mentioned this is 10 years. I think that's the approach we have to take. Um, certainly, I want to work in partnership with our local councils. I think some of our local councils have been doing sterling work. Uh, I've mentioned already the likes of the, the, the Conswater Greenway. Uh, I think that it's a great success in, in the east of the city. Uh, and it's something that certainly that I am determined to, to do my best uh, to work in partnership with Belfast City Council on. Aram, sir, Jennifer McCann. I call Jennifer McCann. Uh, speaker, can I um, sort of uh, ask the minister as well? Because you mentioned the benefits of cycling, and can I ask the minister how many people are currently cycling now in Belfast? Ara. Uh, the Belfast Bike Life report shows that seven million journeys are cycled in Belfast every year. My department's most recent research on cycling to work reveals that five percent of Belfast commuters are already using the bicycle to travel to and from work. The momentum to continue growing is demonstrated by the success of the Belfast Bike Share Scheme, with over 300,000 journeys being taken in the last 18 months. I am confident that this growth in cycling will continue as we continue to invest in better cycling infrastructure, both in urban networks and in the development of our greenways. I call Danny Kennedy. Uh, speaker. And I welcome the uh, Minister's responses thus far. And I ask the Minister what practical steps uh, does he intend to take to uh, outside of Belfast and rural areas to further develop the cycling revolution which I initiated. Uh, I thank the member and indeed I thank him for getting the wheels of revolution turning, uh, as I may put it like that. But certainly it's a, it's a uh, reputation that I want to build on and certainly do what I can over the next mandate to, to continue that. The bicycle strategy, of course, as a member is no doubt aware, envisages a comprehensive network for the bicycle, not just in Belfast but right across the north. The strategic plan for greenways is one element of that and the urban network plans is another. My intention following the publication of the Belfast is to learn from the experience and then roll it out, of course, to other urban centres uh, that we can learn from. I call William Humphreys. Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I commend what the Minister said about the Consort Greenway? The committee was there a couple of weeks ago. Can I just ask the Minister, in terms of extending that sort of initiative out, which is a great um, collaborative approach with government, big lottery, and city council, can we have similar facilities across the city? I know they're expensive, but I think such an investment, perhaps not on that scale, would be hugely beneficial to our people across Belfast. Yes, and again, I, I was out in Victoria Park and, and, and around that particular area and, and Orangefield too. And we have the examples where Rivers Agency and City Council are working to the, together. Uh, I think, and the projects they're delivering are first class. So it's a model I think there, there is much value in, and certainly a model I'm more than happy to work with. I call Sydney Anderson. Uh, question six, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, utility companies are required to notify Transport NI of all works on roads and footpaths through the Street Works Registration and Notification System. Transport NI inspects a 10% sample of all utility openings within six months following completion and inspects a further 10% sample within the last three months of the reinstatement warranty period. This is, if this is to ensure compliance with the specification for reinstatement of openings in roads. The cost of these inspections is recovered from the utility companies themselves. Of course, Transport NI also identifies defective reinstatements through routine road condition inspections, inspections in response to third-party reports, and a six-monthly core survey. 
This is where core samples are taken from fissury compliant reinstatements. Where a reinstatement fails to comply with the specification, the utility company is notified and is required to carry out repairs. Follow-up inspections are carried out to ensure remedial works have been completed. The cost of these follow-up inspections is also recovered from the utility company. Transport NI uses sample inspection results as a key performance indicator for utility companies and informs those com companies of performance on a monthly basis. Progress is also discussed at quarterly meetings of the NI Road Authority and Utilities Committee. In, a, in the event that an individual utility company's performance becomes unacceptable, Transport NI has powers to increase the number of chargeable inspections until such time as performance improvements have been achieved. Sydney Anderson for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, I am sure you are well aware of the state of many of our roads and footpaths uh, following reinstatements by service providers and contractors. And in my own upper bank constituency and right across Northern Ireland, we see many examples of poor reinstatements, with, I would say, the most annoying being new roads and footpaths that have been dug up, question, which could please. have been avoided with proper forward uh, uh, planning. Can I ask you, Minister, is the present reinstatement specification outdated? and in much need of change. Well, I thank the member for his question. Indeed, his, his interest in this. Th this is something I'm currently looking at uh, at the minute. Um, I think uh, you know, I share the member's frustration, indeed, the wider public. You know, we see public realm schemes come into place in many re uh, of our regional towns and villages, and then six months later, there's maybe curbs lifted or flagstones lifted. And there's a sense, especially amongst traders, that why couldn't this be done six months ago? Why couldn't this be done? Um, so it's something I am looking at, certainly, to examine if more needs to be done to the policy. Uh, and it's something, if that is the case, I'd be more than happy to do so. Aaron, sir, Declan Kearney. I call Declan Kearney. I get a fee if you ask Concordia, because my has Ditcha Minister, how much has your department charged utility companies for unsatisfactory reinstatement of paths and roadways? Uh, my department charged utility companies just over £100,000 for follow-up inspections carried out in 2015-16 to ensure defective reinstatements had been adequately repaired. I call Justin McNulty. Thank you, Madam Deputy Principal Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers to date. Can you tell me what are the guidelines specifications with which the utility companies must uh, adhere to, and what is the timescale by which they must comply in terms of their reinstatement of footways, roadways. And the minister can choose which question he answers. Yeah, I don't have the guidelines in front of me, but if the member wants to write to me, I'd be more than happy to share them with him. I call David Ford. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the minister what powers his department has to ensure greater coordination between other agencies which have the right to dig up roads, and specifically, if there is injury or damage caused, is the contractor held liable or is the Department for Infrastructure liable? Well, Transport NI exchanges details of the programme work with utility companies to ensure any potential issues are identified at an earliest stage as possible. Notifications of planned works are also placed on the Street Works Registration and Notification System, which identifies potential conflicts. Uh, where a conflict is identified between planned resurfacing works or other major road works and planned utility works, Transport NI will liaise with the utility company to ensure that the utility company works are completed in advance of the resurfacing scheme were at all possible. This has been the case with our rural roads initiative, where in a number of locations right across the north, work has been held back until utility companies are finished, and then the rural roads initiative will take place later in the year. I call Trevor Clark. Seven. My department's costs for street lighting arise from three main areas. These are new provision and renewal of street lighting installations, street lighting operation and maintenance activities, and street lighting electricity costs. For all of these areas of work, my department uses competitive tendering to ensure the street lighting materials, labour and electricity are procured in a way that delivers best value for money. The costs for new provision and maintenance activities are relatively straightforward to calculate. They are simply the product of the applicable contract rate for the various items of work done, multiplied by the quantities delivered by the contractors. Calculating the cost for street lighting and electricity is a little more complex. Unlike most commercial, industrial or domestic electricity supplies, street lighting electricity is not metered. This is typical of most public lighting supply arrangements across the world. Instead of metering, my department maintains a comprehensive inventory of all street lighting assets from which the electricity consumption can be calculated. 
The electricity costs are arrived at by multiplying the numbers of each type of streetlight by their respective wattage, by their annual operating hours, by the relevant supplier's tender price per kilowatt hour. Trevor Clark for a supplement. Can I thank the Minister for that very comprehensive answer? I'm sure the Minister will agree that many people are concerned, I mean we're all concerned within our own homes, in terms of energy wastage. And can the, I'm sure, can, the, can the Minister then consider maybe what his department could do, given that many occasions we see streetlights lit at times they shouldn't be within our areas and someone's bearing a cost? But, so can I ask the Minister if they'd be minded to do something more in terms of actually reducing the energy costs that has actually been used? Yes, uh, and, and indeed we have. There, there have been um, an investment of £3 million during the last financial year to retrofit approximately 15,000 streetlights in the Band Bridge and Craigavon areas with new LED lanterns that has resulted in a significant energy and maintenance cost savings of over a third of a million pounds per year. Iram, sir, Kiva Archibald. I call Kiva Archibald. Um, could I ask the Minister or could I thank him for his responses first of all? Could I ask him how much does the electricity for street lighting cost each year? Uh, the annual cost of electricity for street lighting varies from year to year, depending on the prevailing cost of electricity and the number of street lights and their associated wattage. In recent years, the annual cost has typically been in the order of £10 million. Fortunately, like many other electricity consumers, my department has seen a reduction in the unit cost of electricity in the last year. Taken over the past five-year period, the approximate cost of providing and maintaining my department's street lighting assets average as follows. Six million per annum for new provision and renewal of old street lighting systems. 7.3 million per annum for routine maintenance and inspection, testing and safety repairs. And 10 million per annum for electricity. Aaron, sir, Declan McAleer. I call Declan McAleer. Uh, can I just ever have to question the Atlanta Hall? One of my key priorities as Minister for Infrastructure is to redress the North's infrastructure deficit, particularly west of the Ban. The A5 scheme will provide a high-quality road link between Derry, Straban, Oma and Ballygolly and unlock the potential for future economic development in these areas. Following the public consultation into the draft orders and environmental statement for the scheme, my department appointed the Planning Appeals Commission as the independent inspector to administer a public inquiry. This inquiry opened on the 4th of October and the hearing is scheduled to close in mid-December 2016, with the inspector's report expected around May 2017. My department will consider the report's recommendations in detail before I make a decision on whether to proceed with the scheme and make the necessary statutory orders. In late August 2016, the Alternative A5 Alliance applied for leave for a judicial review. My department is opposing the application for leave, which has been listed for hearing in November 2016. Subject to the successful completion of all the statutory procedures and a satisfactory outcome from the inspector's report, it is anticipated that construction can commence in late 2017 on Phase 1A in line with the Fresh Start Agreement. I am currently engaging with the department officials to explore options to maximise delivery of the A5 during the current mandate. Declan McAleer for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his comprehensive answer and I can say with certainty that the overwhelming majority of people are looking forward to this scheme progressing. Could the Minister tell me, has a contractor been appointed for the A5 dual carriageway project? Yes, uh, three contractor joint ventures have been appointed to the integrated delivery team, with each uh, joint venture awarded one section of the scheme. Subject to satisfactory completion of the statutory procedures and making of the orders, the joint venture contractor for Phase 1A, Balfour Beatty, BAM FP McCann, will be instructed to complete the detailed design and construct the scheme. I call George Savage. Who's he? Who's he? <laughs> I call George Robinson. Thank you, uh, President and Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister give an update on the A26 project and does he envisage any delays? Hmm. Minister. Uh, no delays are envisaged. Uh, work is ongoing uh, and I am actually visiting the scheme soon and I expect the, the work to be completed next year. I call Mark Durkin. If you will ask Sean Cordy, I'll bring the Minister back to the A5. Following uh, the, the delays that this project has encountered thus far, how confident is the Minister that this time the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and the, the Department do have a robust case and plan that won't be brought down in the courts by opponents to the scheme? The member is right uh, when you allude to the, 
the length of time the local communities in these areas have been, have been waiting. Um, I'm certainly confident that all has been done in my department's case uh, to dot the I's and cross the T's. Um, but as I say, we must respect the statutory processes now and the, uh, and the will of the court. And certainly as the hearing progresses, I will do all that I can to ensure that this scheme begins. As I say, those in the West have been crying out for this scheme to commence. Uh, and I think we wish them all well on that. That ends the period uh, for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, with winter just around the corner, what budget have you allocated for the winter treatment of roads in each of the four divisions? I thank the member. The, the, the member may be aware that we are currently bringing into place a data analyst um, to guide the department when it comes to, to, to weather, um, certainly to give perhaps a more in-depth and scientific than what we might be doing this evening on the 6 o'clock news. Uh, we work closely with river agencies also, uh, who have a very detailed uh, team that can obviously work with the weather. And can I rest assured to the member that all is in place now with the winter service, uh, certainly with the, the collection of salt and to ensure that we have the services in place. Uh, for the winter period and the inclement weather that is likely to come. Rosemary Barton for supplementary. Yeah. Um, what budget have you allocated to those areas? The, the financial the budget is we are still finalising the terms of the final budget, uh, but certainly we're going ahead with the, as I say, bringing in place the, the data analyst to, to guide us. But this, this certainly will not hold up any of the winter services that we've proceeded. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will appreciate that for the people of Lurgan, the Millennium Way project has been coming for what seems like a millennium. Um, and I pay tribute to my former Can the member come to her question? colleagues, Sam Gardner, and your predecessor, Minister Kennedy, for their determination. We learn that it's further delayed, so can the Minister update this House as to why? Uh, I believe there's several. Uh, unintended problems when it came to certain junctions with the scheme. The scheme had been progressing well, um, and as I say, due to an intense number of uh, utilities uh, that were discovered and certainly have to be dealt with in a timely manner, uh, this, this scheme is now delayed. Uh, and I certainly, coming up to a busy period, uh, will be working with the department, with the officials, and those in transport and I to ensure that this has as little disruption to those traders in the busy Christmas period as possible. Joanne Dobson for a supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his answer and appreciate the circumstances and his answer. I think he's saying the main sticking area seems to be with the utility providers. Um, can I ask whether this delay will mean any additional costs associated to the eventual completion of the project? I'm certainly not aware uh, of any additional costs. I am due to get a briefing later uh, in further detail around what is likely now to be a delay of a few months to the scheme. But at the outset, certainly before we've had that, I'm not aware of any additional costs. Aram Sir Sinead Bradley. I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'd like to ask the Minister, following on from the £10 million that was set aside for rural roads, and whilst it was very welcome, once it was carved up, it didn't seem to go far enough. And does the Minister have any intention to uh, reach out to those rural network roads that have not been fixed? And particularly, there's an issue as well with road markings and repainting some road markings that have all but disappeared. Yeah. You know, the, the member is correct, £10 million towards rural roads. When you consider that we have somewhere in the region of a, a billion pound backlog in road maintenance, you know, £10 million is a drop in the ocean. Uh, but certainly for those communities that uh, divisional managers have now identified roads, uh, such as Mullagarth Road in, our, in, the, in the member's own constituency, uh, you know, where it hasn't seen a resurfacing in more than a decade, if not longer. Uh, so this £10 million will have went uh, some way, of course, to addressing that. There are those communities who have always felt isolated, that they have never got a piece of the pie. Uh, but certainly, I am under no illusions, I don't think anybody is, that you know, in no way, stretch your imagination, are we going to address a billion pound backlog of road maintenance. Certainly in my time as infrastructure minister over the next five years, I think this needs to be a generational approach, a more strategic approach uh, to how we do this and how we budget and finance for road maintenance. Uh, it's one thing designing new roads projects. We also have to be mindful 
of the road network that we currently have, and I will be doing all of my part to set in place a new strategic framework for how we finance for road maintenance. Sinead Bradley for supplementary. Thank you. Um, just adding to that, the, I, I just want to check if the Minister is aware there is a section of the A2 dual carriageway from Newry to Warren Point, which is in particularly bad need of resurfacing. Is the Minister aware of that, or is there any plans to have that resurface work carried out? I'm not aware if there's any plans to resurface the road. I'm well aware of the road. It's a road I would travel uh, often, um, but I, I'm not aware if there are currently any plans to do so. Uh, I would say all members in this House will have a list of them their arm of particular roads in rural areas, especially that need resurfaced. Um, you know, it is, it's, 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 it's not a sob story as such, but our budgets are being pressurised. You know, it's been the case for a number of years now, uh, and we have to do whatever we can with the money that's available to us. As I say, when it comes to road maintenance, I think we need to think long term. I, we had a discussion lately uh, during the German debate on this that I think it needs to have a far more strategic, long term approach uh, to road maintenance. I call Naomi Long. Um, thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware that EU directives have driven much of the investment and improvement in terms of wastewater uh, discharges um, to the environment. In light of Brexit, what um, recommendations are his department bringing forward in terms of what will guide uh, wastewater treatment directives in future? The member is correct. Much of it has been because of that, but uh, certainly going forward, and this is you know, perhaps much of the heat, much of the debate has been around funding, but of course my department also has responsibility when it comes to regulation, um, and wastewater is certainly a part of that, um, and something will be taken forward. Uh, I haven't actually uh, seen any information with regards to the member's specific question, uh, but if the member wants to, to correspond with me, I'd be more than happy to do so. Naomi Long for supplementary. Yeah, I mean, I thank the Minister for his response. In Westminster, there will be a great repeal bill which will replace legislation which currently governs um, issues such as this um, with, with locally uh, agreed legislation. Will there be a similar process in the Assembly to go, through, um, to go through that legislation which currently governs issues such as wastewater treatment? I'm not aware of the exact process that will go through to governance uh, that. Uh, I know I have a briefing with officials next week. Uh, I have a Brexit team within my department looking at a number of these. Uh, and while the, the initial conversations to date have revolved around funding and immediate situations, certainly no regulations is one of the items on the agenda. I call Danny Kennedy. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I ask the Minister uh, whether he has considered uh, availing of the use of any additional expert, uh, expertise uh, to more accurately uh, predict weather patterns in the coming winter period. No, I, I think, as, as I've outlined to the, colleagues, or the member's colleague earlier, uh, I think there has, over the last number of years, been a tradition we're working in, in close tandem with Rivers Agency, who, again, as the recent Auditor in General's report has identified, you know, flood risk maps are very apt and actually very accurate uh, in detailing the, the risks. It is so it is the same with the weather. But uh, you know, if the, the member has any ideas or suggestions, I'm more than happy to listen to them. Danny Kennedy for a supplementary. Thank the, 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 the Minister for his, uh, his response. Um, uh, can I ask the Minister, in terms of winter services. Uh, has he any plans to increase the number of grip piles in rural areas in my Nuri and Armagh constituency to support rural communities? Certainly, again, as, an, an, as a representative of a rural uh, constituency, and no doubt I have probably championed the cause of grip piles with the former minister in previous years. I am all too aware of the need, I think, you know, we know of you know, the, the, the treacherous journey sometimes that uh, commuters have to take in rural areas, and specifically when it comes to grit and salt during the winter months, you know, we know there is much correspondence with the department. The, minister, or the former minister will know uh, that undoubtedly. Uh, so it is something I look at, specifically with Newry and Armagh. You know, this is something we have to look at on a constituency basis on, on need, uh, and not, support, not so strictly geographically. But I says, you know, before, we have to take cognizance of the fact that we, do our, 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 we are operating under limited budgets at this time, and we have to do as much as we can with those limited budgets. Aaron, sir, Catherine Seeley. I call Catherine Seeley. Thank you, Madam, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses to date. Can I ask the Minister, does he feel that there will be any p potential investment or indeed shared knowledge following his recent trip to China? Yeah, thank the Member for her question. Uh, and I suppose at the outset, um, can I thank Tim Lusty, 
um, from the NI Bureau uh, and the staff at the NI Bureau uh, for facilitating ma many of the meetings uh, that I had in China over the last week. Uh, I would also like to thank, uh, put on record my thanks to the Confucius Institute, in particular Dr. Yan Liu, who insisted us greatly uh, on the visit uh, and certainly helped to open a lot of doors, which I think going forward into the future will be a great benefit. Um, on, the, on the first leg of the question around investment, uh, I was delighted to have the opportunity to meet with the President of the China Investment Corporation, uh, President Tu, and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank in Beijing earlier last week. It is very clear that not only they are interested in building relationships and building a friendship uh, with the people of Ireland, uh, certainly they are interested, I think, in investing in some of our infrastructure projects over the next number of years. And that's something that I very much look forward to meeting them once again back here in Ireland uh, to discuss these projects in, in further detail. With regard to shared learning, and I think this is perhaps an area where we may be able to, to work out quickest, um, certainly to have discussions with the Beijing Municipal Authority around congestion around car parking. Uh, I think there are a number of uh, initiatives from public transport and active travel that are occurring now in Beijing that we can certainly uh, learn from. As I mentioned earlier, this afternoon scale, is, of course, is certainly very, very different. Um, they're dealing with a, you know, a city of over 20 million people. We're not dealing with that. But many of the, the problems, many of the issues and the solutions are very much similar. Um, so something I think we can certainly build on for the future. Catherine Seeley for a supplementary. Thank you, and I welcome the Minister's response. Um, would the Minister agree that if Brexit does mean Brexit, um, that China will become a, a very important ally in building the economy here in the North? I think even, even before uh, the EU referendum result, uh, there is no doubt uh, that China is a, a super global power in this. You know, we, we only have to cast our eye across Europe to see a number of the, the large-scale and even smaller infrastructure projects uh, that, that China is investing in. Um, there is no doubt that you know, the, the, the axis of global uh, power, I suppose, is perhaps tilting east. Uh, many political commentators would say so. Um, you know, I, I took the opportunity to, to visit the Hubei province, you know, where, where there are cities that perhaps some people may have never heard of, and there are 10, 12, 15 million populations in these cities. There are hugely ambitious infrastructure programs. There is a lot that we can learn. And I think the best thing for us is there is a willingness on the, on the part of the Chinese to, also in, to, to join us in that campaign, because they have much to learn from us also. Aram, sir, or Mark Dirk, and I call Mark. Mark. A few days, Kion, Kulia, can the Minister tell the House how many bicycles there are in Beijing? No. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. No, uh, I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Could the Minister please outline to the House his view on LED street lighting? Uh, there are not enough bicycles in Beijing, I think it is fair to say. Uh, but, but all joking aside, you know, when you touch upon that, we, we were shown images actually of the bicycles in Beijing in the 1980s, and they absolutely outnumbered all the cars. But as the growth in the, the, the economy happened in Beijing, the bicycle disappeared, and the car happened. It's the exact same problems that we face here uh, when it comes to congestion. It's something they're also tackling. So again, there's much to learn from that. But as far as the LED, um, I think that the the retrofit scheme, to a large extent, has been successful. There are a number of issues, I think, uh, that caught people by surprise in that the, the amount of white light was not as much as the, the, the old system in place. Uh, and I think that once people get used to that, I think that will allay a lot of fears. Um, but again, it's something I want to look at. You know, I have mentioned earlier this afternoon of the savings that are involved and in, in, in the expense of actually having the old system. So it's something I am looking at, because uh, I do believe it is a project worth pursuing. Mark Darkin for a supplementary. Uh, and we won't the, put him counting the bicycles in Beijing. Uh, 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 I thank the Minister for his answers thus far and recognise the problems that have existed in some places where schemes have been carried out. However, does the Minister recognise the environmental as well as the economic benefits that such uh, lighting brings and perhaps the possibility of replacing more street lights, as we do know the pressures that the Minister's maintenance budget is under, but there might be more access to capital for such an environmentally friendly scheme? Yeah, and certainly, and we know, for example, that there may be opportunities through the Invest to Save. And is this something I continue to look at? Actually, the department we, we have discussed this, uh, and if it is something that is feasible, affordable uh, to roll out in the future, it is something I am more than willing to look at. 
And that completes our question time to the Minister for Infrastructure. Um, can members take their ease while we change the table?